Okay, I think we, we can start. So welcome everyone. I'm very happy to chair this session. And uh, as you know, we have, uh, uh, this is the session in education and training, the software engineering education and training track. And um, we will have, um, as you know, as usual, we will have uh, now, we will start with all the presentation, in, in particular in this session, uh, we have uh, five, uh, five uh, great presentation we will have, and uh, after we will uh, have some, uh, some discussion. So uh, if you agree, we can start with the first uh, uh, paper. And uh, I remember you that uh, this is a recorded session in case I hope uh, is everything is fine with you. And I will encourage you to use these emoticons not to, to be interactive with the uh, presenter. And uh, so please, so we can start with the first uh, uh, paper. So, reading peer feedback in learning software design with UML, we have Satrio. Okay, uh, thank you. Please, Alina. you can start to share your um, screen. Yeah, I'll start to share my screen. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Satrio. Uh, I'm presenting my our work guiding peer feedback in learning software design UML design using UML. It's our, my work with Professor Michel Chaudron. We are both uh, affiliated with both Institute Technology Bandung in Indonesia and Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. So background to our study, uh, we are considering learning software design. So students uh, find learning software design challenging. There are often no single correct solution for design um, and unlike source code, we cannot test design. And there are often multiple perspectives to consider, including those of several stakeholders to the application or the software in question. And uh, of course, as students, they make mistakes. That's what students do. And they need feedback to help learn from their mistakes. Uh, and the problem is for um, such an open-ended uh, questions such as software design sometimes it's hard for one teacher to give uh, sufficient feedback to dozens of students at a time so there are other source of feedback that we can uh, rely on including from their peers their the, the student peers there are the uh, the pros and cons here doing student peer feedback forces students to think deeper on their design both their peers and their own design but the cons is that uh, no feedback can be considered harmful so to learn about this we formulated these three research questions the first one is what type of feedback do students find helpful and then the second one, how to instruct or guide students to give good feedback. And the third one, how do students use the feedback they receive to improve their design? So in this study, the participants are third year bachelor students in informatics. There is a course called Software Project where the, these students are split into groups of five and each group works on medium sized real world projects either web or mobile apps uh, with actual clients from different application domains and they need to develop the software using agile methods. Uh, in the third iteration or the third sprint, peers are asked to give feedback on the designs by completing review forms. And upon receiving feedback, each group responds by completing a response form. The review or feedback form contains questions regarding the visual appearance of diagrams, the naming of classes and methods, the quality of the design and the, the general document clarity. And then the response form contains questions on how students would improve their design based the, on the review that they received and questions on the clarity of the feedback itself. So uh, after collecting the feedback and the responses, we analyzed 
and categorize uh, the data and everything. And we we arrived at these three conclusions for, for our research questions. The first one, for what type of feedback do students find helpful? Students find that uh, positive feedback are, are helpful. So uh, it actually aligns with many findings from the field of educational psychology that there need to be some kind of ratio between negative and positive feedback uh, to achieve the best uh, acceptance and uh, best motivation to improve their, their learning. And then we also find that students like to be given specific examples of or instances on the feedback, which, which particular classes are not good, for example. And then also uh, we need to separate feedback on syntax and semantics. For the first, uh, for the second research question, how to instruct or guide students to give good feedback, we we provide uh, guidance to uh, directed instruction for points of attention so that students can actually uh, have a clue of which specific uh, characteristics that they need to uh, pay attention to and give a assessment on that. And we also find that asking students to explain the rationale behind their feedback forces them to think deeper uh, and get the better quality of feedback. And for the third research questions, how do students use the feedback to, they receive to improve their design? We found that mostly, uh, as can be expected, the students who receive mostly negative feedback, feedbacks uh, make plans of improvements, while students that receive mostly positive feedbacks make less plans of improvement. But we also find something else in which some students with overly very, very positive feedback, they still plan improvements. And some students who performs poorly with, with negative feedback, they make no plans of improvement. And this shows, uh, among others, motivation that they have in uh, actually finishing the task. So that's our finding and conclusion. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your great, great presentation. So we can uh, uh, proceed with the second uh, paper, uh, a longitudinal case study on the effect of an evidence-based soft engineering training. And uh, the speaker is Sebastian Pizzard. We have uh, Sebastian. Please. You can unmute. OK, please. Yes. Well, thank you for the introduction. Evidence-based software engineering is used by most researchers. For example, it's very common that PhD students begin their research with a secondary study. However, we only know three studies that uh, report secondary studies in non-academic settings. Is it because EPS is not useful for non-academic? Uh, we don't know that. What we don't know is that training is one of the main facilitators to improve adoption of evidence-based practice. So uh, we searched and found only 14 studies presented EPSI training. We studied them to create our own course. Our course is based on learning outcomes, and we want to teach EPSI and systematic review for practical use. We already taught uh, three FC courses, all of them at the Universidad de la Republica in Uruguay. Because we consider FC training as a complex issue uh, from the beginning, we wanted to know if our course was suitable for teaching it. Later on, Barbara proposed to investigate also the effect of the course. Uh, and this was really interesting too. We collected data in three waves between 2017 and 2021. <clears throat> we tried to give participants enough time to use their training. We conducted uh, two surveys. As you can see, we had a very high response rate. 
We consider that the course adequacy is related to the achievement of the learning outcomes by the students. And for evaluating that, we use student safe evaluations and teacher evaluations of the practical task. Uh, the achievement in, in general of the learning outcomes was in long cases above 65%, which we consider very good. Also, everybody who reported using EPS evaluated the training as adequate. We think our training had very interesting effects in, in the students. They reported using many of the skills from the course in their professional practice. Most of the use of the skills were related to awareness of research and scientific evidence and information gathering and information literacy skills. The results uh, of, of our study confirm that our course was adequate and consistent over the three years. Also, the learning outcomes facilitate tra tracking the student performance in each concept of practice of FC. All the material we created is now available in Spanish and in English. And we really want this material to be used or adapted in other universities because we consider that it can serve as a basis for more formalization in FC training as it happens in other fields like medicine. We can say that EPS training makes practitioners more confident in the, value, in the value of scientific evidence and foster its use to support decision making. We don't know if using EPS will close the gap between academia and industry, but our research supports the proposal to use EPS to bring practitioners closer to scientific evidence. And we think that this is a good starting point. As in other fields, training appears uh, to play a key role in the adoption of EPSI. And by now, curricular guides for undergraduate computer students don't consider evidence-based practice. But it's fair to say that we need more studies before considered to include in it in, in the curricular guide. We also know that evidence-based practice training in medicine is more effective when it is integrated with clinical practice. This could be done in FC training too, for example, by engaging practitioners in teaching activities. Last year, we created scenarios of use of evidence with practitioners from government and industry. We used these scenarios to improve our course and we are now analyzing the data. Uh, if you're interested in, in this work, you can contact us. Uh, you can also join our project on ResearchGate. In this project, we use several qualitative methods to improve FCA adoption. Well, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot. Great, I see that also some questions are, are coming in the chat. We will discuss uh, later all together. So we can uh, the third uh, presentation, uh, integrating hackathons into an, an online cybersecurity course. I see now the speaker. Okay, Abasi. Yes. Afia? Okay, yes. please, please. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Abasi Mefanafia, and I will be presenting our paper on integrating hackathons into an online cybersecurity course. Hackathons are time bounded events during which participants can work together, they can form teams and work on projects that are of interest to them. Um, over the years, we've seen uh, hackathons benefiting education by providing a practical approach to learning, especially for cybersecurity education, where um, a practical approach is needed for cybersecurity professionals to deal with uh, real life uh, cyber threats as well and provide practical solutions to them. However, there are existing uh, challenges to the way hackathons have been integrated into educational courses. One of such is the introduction of hackathon events at the end of the course, uh, providing limited opportunity to learn by doing throughout the course. And uh, of course, um, providing this practical approach during the process of the course can be challenging when it's done at the end of the course. As such, we need uh, better hackathon integration into courses. And uh, one, two ways actually that we uh, have proposed this is to introduce multiple hackathons during the course 
But for each hackathon, we develop it in a way that it achieves specific goals. And uh, this can be learning, this can be collaboration as well. When we uh, sought to introduce this into a course, multiple hackathons, uh, we selected a cybersecurity course. This course um, aimed to teach students of a risk-aware perspective when they seek to secure um, the design of software. And uh, as you can see in the figure, we proposed three hackathons following uh, three major concepts in the course. So the course had three major concepts. And after each uh, concept was touched to the students, we introduced a week-long hackathon event. The second part was to introduce interventions in order to make each of these hackathon events achieve certain goals. And um, we introduced three interventions. First was the thematic input, which followed uh, the lectures as well. And these were not just ordinary lectures. The lectures were also um, cognizant of the hackathon events or the hackathon tasks that would be carried out. The second intervention was the targeted feedback where the course instructors or any industry professional can come in and give their expert feedback on how the students handle their tasks and the, the hackathon goals of the students as well. Lastly was the collaboration support where we provided resources for uh, the teams to work together. As hackathons are primarily team-based, uh, this was, we saw as very efficient and to provide uh, some engagement to improve the team process and enable them to complete their hackathon tasks together. Um, at the end of each hackathon event, we uh, collected questionnaire responses and we analyzed these responses at the end of the course. So we found that the, the students reported a positive perception of how they work together within their teams, in their team goals, participation process. But they also gave uh, responses to how we um, handled the interventions and how they saw the interventions as well. Uh, they had positive perceptions of the lecture, the feedback, uh, and also the collaboration support, which was where we gave the team management plan for the teams. And they had an overall positive perception of the, their learning as well. But additionally, we collected open-ended responses where the students were able to give their feedback on the benefits of each of the interventions. And here we found that uh, for the lecture interventions, it provided the most benefits for the students where the lecture resources are understandable and also applicable to the hackathon tasks as well. For the targeted feedback, uh, it saw benefits to prevent the students from repeating past mistakes as they continue in the, in the course. And so the student doesn't move on to the end of the course with a wrong notion of the concepts that have been taught in the course as well. Lastly, for the collaborative support, we saw benefits when uh, of this support when the students are able to collaborate for the first time. And as such, they're strangers, they don't know each other. And especially in the online format, it, it would be difficult for them to have uh, met before these hackathon events. And for the collaborative support, we also saw benefits to help the students learn rapidly when they're able to work together as a team to complete the task. Uh, in conclusion, we saw benefits to the overall learning environment of the students. Um, introducing multiple hackathons in, in the course provided multiple points at which the students can learn better, can support their learning goals as well. And uh, we saw all overall positive perception on uh, their learning process. And uh, thank you. Great, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Okay, so we can uh, uh, proceed with the other uh, paper. Uh, keeping funnel report or running online coding campus. So the, 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 the speaker is Luis Coral, I think it's Luis is here. Okay, please, please, you can share your. Uh, if you can unmute the microphone. <laughs> yeah. So can you see the slides now? 
Yeah, please, please. Okay, very good. Um, okay, thanks for, for your attention and thanks for the time for this presentation. My I'm a lecturer and researcher at Tec de Monterrey in Mexico, and this work was done in collaboration with my co-authors in the University of Bolzano in Italy. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick up in the in the previous in the previous topic about um, hackathons. We've been running a, a series of summer school slash hackathons with uh, high school students in the Free University of Bolzano, northern Italy, for about ten years. Uh, the thing is that as uh, many of our work. Uh, was 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 he was affected by uh, by COVID in in the last two years? Uh, we committed to continue with the with the school changing the format and adjusting whatever is necessary to keep up with the with the delivery of the course, but adapting with the possibilities that the pandemic gave us uh, two year uh, two years ago. So that also posed uh, in us a series of challenges, uh, pretty much as as many of you as researchers and, and instructors. But we wanted also to. Uh, review what kind of opportunities these challenges would give us in order to understand better what would be the interaction and the learning process for uh, people attending this kind of learning experiences. Uh, on top of that, our audience was was rather was rather complicated, was rather hard because uh, we we do not address this um, this hackathon or this summer school to young adults or professionals in computer science. This is for high school students, so. The target audience also made an additional challenge in the aspect that they are not uh, used to an online interaction or to a, a remote collaboration as, as as we have in industry and as we have in 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 in, in higher education. But instead, they also faced as as many of us this uh, remote working for the first time. So that was also uh, one of the most important challenges that we had when designing the same uh, school experience, but translated into a, an online format. So that was our, our baseline of this work. In coding camps, students uh, get together, or participants get together to understand a concept and deliver a product so they can also learn by doing. But with the COVID environment, uh, we had this number of challenges that prevented us from have a face-to-face -face interaction and to have a, 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 a personal relationship to create and to and to share while learning and while producing but still we wanted to continue with this experience and we wanted to continue uh, with with it by adjusting and, and 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 changing whatever is necessary to keep up promoting the interaction to keep up promoting the a learning experience and also to keep promoting the engagement of the participants so this this last term engagement is what this work is all about so our challenge was um, students uh, didn't have a lot of experience um, interacting remotely uh, so that was something that part of the the baseline education that we also had to provide this is the platform uh, this is the the way that you use it and this is also the way that you are going to use to communicate right communication issues mm, Everybody was connected from anywhere, so we couldn't guarantee that everybody had the same uh, internet speed or the same quality of device and so on. Uh, and also the fact of not being co-located also could put some sort of uh, hardship in the sense of belonging. Uh, there is also a risk of a lack of engagement that they are, they call in and they are there, but probably they are not paying attention or they are not exercising or they are not communicating. So we also had to account for that and overcome uh, proactively what could be the best way to, to 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 handle this fatigue the famous zoom fatigue every time uh, we, we spend days we spend weeks in front of a computer uh trying to work on a study or interact so uh, the time that we spend in front in front of a, of a screen was also uh, more expensive than previously because of the of the fatigue that this may that this may uh cause and finally we wanted to have the same experience and the same success on participants as if it was uh, face to face. So it was, was also part of our challenges. So the redesign of the coding camp or the adjustments on the coding camp accounted for these challenges. I already explained the target audience, uh, high school students that are not necessarily committed to computer science, but this is going to be the first time that they aren't going to have any access to that. Um, the goal was to uh, offer the same curriculum that is a primer on software development processes and a primer on mobile development uh, practices using uh, 
block-based programming. We, we do not assume that they have any background in computer science and programming. So we, we overcome that, that challenge of uh, understanding and having a good command on coding by using a block-based programming environment. If you are familiar with Scratch, that is, you know, pulling block together and, and trying a, a functionality, we use a similar tool. It's called uh, Thunkable. If you're also familiar with App Inventor, that permits you to create um, Android uh, application. Thunkable is a fork of that that permits you to create both iOS and Android applications without any previous knowledge on uh, coding. Uh, it's um, it's one week long, uh, uh, half uh, half the week, uh, which is uh, an afternoon schedule. Mm -hmm for five days and students team up in teams of three so the the fact or, or the, the 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 value that we are proposing on this coding camp that was held online for two years was to in addition to the uh, the technical curriculum and the technical journey that in any case we're going to cover, we also put together a series of games, activities that we deem that are fun and that created and, um, and a dynamic environment where uh, students can exercise and can do things together and can do things on their own so that we break the ice, but we also uh, attack the Zoom fatigue. And we always uh, attach a purpose on each game so that it, this is not just to have fun and this is just not to disconnect from the screen, but also there is something that you learn out of that. So we propose four games, one for each day, where we, um, uh, as I said, we, we, we incorporated also some sort of uh, educational uh, lessons on, on that. So the purpose was to keep the phone alive, to have these games as a um, as an important enabler, as an important tool to keep the team engaged and also to offer some some learnings on that. For example, uh, one of the games was to, uh, we, we gave them a list of 30 things, 30 items that they can easily uh, example, bring on something red, bring on something broken, bring on something that you love so that they can be uh, creative and they can be resourceful. And then we explain creativity and resourcefulness is an important trait that you need in computer science and software development because of this, because of that. Then uh, we ask them to create a, a tower of paper, um, paper pieces. Uh, and of course, we give a prize to the, to the highest one. And at the same time, we linked it to an educational purpose of saying by designing your tower of paper up front, you will uh, be you know closer to the objective of giving a taller one. In software development, you also have some sort of designs up front where you need to be flexible, but at the same time, you need to have requirements and so on. So you, you, you have the key on this, right? Every game that is proposed is linked to an educational purpose, is linked to uh, software development. So uh, by the end of the, of, the of the coding experience, we had um, also open to the conclusion. Yep. Uh, we, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we had uh, this open-end uh, service where we collected what was the, 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 the most important takeaway and the, the most important learning on that. And we discovered also, or we found out that uh, the fact of incorporating gaming was also part of the important uh, engagement experiences that they have, that they kept them engaged and they kept them, you know, covering this learning process. So thanks for your attention and thanks for your eventual comments and answers. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for the great uh, presentation. Okay, so we, we have the last uh, uh, presentation. So peer structure in online software testing, continuous integration, a replication study. I see the uh, speaker should be, okay. If you can start to share. Uh, your screen so the speaker is Bhuvaneswari Gobal Kopal sorry for the pronunciation please you can uh, better introduce yourself so. it's Bhuvaneswari Gopal I go by Bhuvana okay. um, uh, good morning everyone I'm in central time so I'm saying good morning but good afternoon to those of you who are in other time zones um, I'd like to share our work on peer instruction in online software testing and continuous integration we did a replication study of our previous work, and I want to talk a little bit about what we found. So as we all know, software testing and you know DevOps, especially unit testing, integration testing, and continuous integration are kind of the 
uh, cornerstones of what we teach software engineering students to start out with uh, in terms of how we can test code and how we can continuously integrate it. Um, the, we, uh, do, in doing a, a little bit of a literature review, we found that um, software testing education has not gone past, you know, maybe gaming and some kind of, you know, scaffolding, but not really into active learning technologies. So we try to incorporate an active learning approach called peer instruction in teaching software testing. Uh, we did this earlier and published our work um, at a previous conference. Um, we did that in person, but now we are reporting the results of how we replicated this in a fully online environment and, uh, you know, whether we saw similar gains and things like that. So our main research questions were twofold. We looked at the cognitive effect of peer instruction and the affective effect of peer instruction. So first research question is whether you know, unit testing, integration testing, and continuous integration are learned by students better in a completely online uh, synchronous class with peer instruction versus without. The second one was whether their enjoyment of learning these topics um, actually improved in a peer instruction class online versus a purely lecture format class online. The original study was in person, like I said earlier, it had a bunch of different majors in, uh, and it was mostly honor students, um, specifically computing majors and management and uh, uh, you know business majors. The replication that we did was uh, completely fully synchronous online, synchronous as in you know real time uh, conducted class um, at the same time that the students were present. Uh, and it was primarily uh, you know computing majors, CS or CE. Um, with um, mostly non-honors students. So um, I don't want to go over this in detail, but I just wanted to show you, we have some data to tell you how the college standing of our students was split up between, you know, uh, what we call the treatment group and the control group. So we had two groups of students, right? The purely online lecture format class we call the control group. And then a year after we con conducted the lecture, we did the same thing with a purely online peer instruction class. That is the treatment group. So there's a somewhat of a similar breakdown of the majors, and uh, we can see that there's not great dissimilarities there. Um, our main research methods were a pre-test, post-test hybrid approach, where we used a between groups and within groups um, yeah, analysis of variance uh, to you know, determine whether we had statistically significant results. So each of these sections, the treatment group and the control group was each a year apart. We utilized two questionnaires. We had a cognitive questionnaire that I developed, um, you know, which I've been using throughout for the last four or five years in various studies regarding peer instruction and other active learning technologies. Um, uh, so unit testing, integration testing, continuous integration questions were in the cognitive questionnaire. And for the affective questionnaire, we used a uh, uh, previously validated instrument by Moscow and Hegg, uh, which covered five different constructs, confidence, interest, gender, usefulness, and professionalism. And here's an example of what a cognitive question would look like. How does the single responsibility principle affect testability? Or something like, why, what are some common reasons why a build might hang in continuous integration? So the, the very basic premise of peer instruction is that students teach each other during class time. So instructor, instead of giving a complete, you know, 50 minute le lecture session, that's a mini lecture followed by what we call PI cycles or peer instruction cycles. Each cycle has the first vote where the instructor poses a question in the class, students answer real time using student response systems. Instructor looks real time at the feedback and says, okay, the, the threshold for correctness of, you know, maybe 30% of the students got it right, which means more than two thirds of the class did not get this right. Let's go into a breakout session with each group where students discuss in small groups. And then after two or three minutes of discussion, they come back and vote a second time, what we call V2. And then hopefully the goal is if peer instruction works, then V2 has improved responses, right? And then we the instructor ends each of these cycles with a short discussion clearly indicating the correct answer and moving on to the next part of the mini lecture. Um, so, and for each uh, each one of these cycles, we had uh, a newly assigned, randomly assigned group. So again, I said there's a pre-test, post-test format. So here's the pre-test, here's the post-test. And the only difference between the control and treatment group is that materials being the same, the topics being the same, instructor being the same, order of uh, you know content being taught the being the same, the first control group was all lecture. 
um, the treatment group conducted in a, a previous year was all completely using the PI cycles. So I, okay, I have a you summary. Can go to the to this to the conclusion, you have one minute uh, yeah, model. Yeah. So. Okay. So uh, we looked at the within groups and the be, uh, between groups uh, design here, which is between the treatment group, did we have improvements? And between the treatment group and the control group, did we have improvements? We found that within the treatment group, in, we had significant gains, correctness gains, after peer instruction as compared to purely lecture, 41% of students, 51%, 57%. And we found that we also found statistically significant results um, between the control and the treatment groups, meaning overall students learned better in the pure instruction group versus just the pure lecture group. So um, there are some limitations to the study, which I can discuss with you. If, if you would like, you can ask me questions and I'd be happy to discuss. Um, but our future directions really are in figuring out whether there was any effect of internships or other external factors. And specifically, what did the online environment do to these students that we saw better gains than even you know, in-person peer instruction? So that was my time. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope to answer any questions you might have. Great. Thanks a lot for his very, very presentation. Thank you. There is some echo. OK. OK, I think we can now start with the, uh, with the, the, the question, the discussion session. Um, I see one, uh, one question in the chat. So maybe if you agree, we can start with a question from the, from the chat. I don't know if the person that uh, uh, written the question if uh, can ask if you want to ask maybe you were you you uh, you asked for Sebastian right yeah um please, I did and I think Sebastian answered it pretty well I didn't want to interrupt when the others were presenting oh, no, no, you, please, please, you can you can explain yeah. the question and we can uh, yeah my, qu my question was really to understand how is evidence-based software engineering really different from something like what I did which is an empirical study in figuring out here is it. Here is what I did. Uh, I did an intervention. Students learned better, or they did not learn better, right? How is that difference from evidence-based software engineering? He's already given me an answer, which I think is great. But I'll let you explain further. Yes, I, I think that uh, most of, of us um, think that FC is about uh, systematic reviews, but uh, it's not only about that. It's, for example, uh, if you are facing a problem translate that problem into a question that you can answer with a systematic review. And then uh, after you found a systematic review or you conducted one, uh, how to translate the results to, to address that pro a real problem you have. All of that is that we teach to the students. So the, they are trying to use scientific evidence that they found um, or they found uh, in primary studies or in secondary studies already done. And, and this is the, the main difference with, I think, with empirical studies. May I okay. ask a follow-up to it or uh, should I wait for... Um... Is it is quick, otherwise we no, can uh, give you... Up. So, when, when, Sebastian, so when students look at this literature or try to, you know, understand the scientific evidence behind it, um, are there specific topics for which this works better? Or is this all, uh, when you say EBSC, is it across all, all topics in software engineering? Is it split up by topics or not? No, it's, it's about all topics. Where we okay. teach them is about how to search studies, how to evaluate the quality of the studies, all, all FC and the topics. Uh, they, they work on a practical assignment and they choose the, their topic. So Great. They, Thank they you. have this motivation. Thank you. Great, great. Um, so now I have a uh, question for you, Baub, uh, Satrio. Maybe you can, uh, if you want to ask directly the question. There's a question by Luis before me. So ah, I yeah, right. Sorry, Luis. Please, Luis, if you want to ask uh, for uh, Abasi, please, please. Yes, thank you. Abasi, I was interested in your in your work because you also work with, with hackathons. So I, I was just curious about what, what is your take, what is your view on, on, on running hackathons in these both formats, in these two formats, face-to-face uh, -face and online, if you uh, can identify a particular hardship or challenge on running them online. So I can contrast also with my experience. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, we actually ran this study fully online. Uh, so, um, and we had the chance to meet with students uh, for the feedback sessions, uh, sometimes face to face, but most of the, the hackathon study was done online. And one of the, the biggest problems that we had in this case was engagement and uh, working in teams. It was one of our greatest um, benefits uh, for, for those that really excelled, but it was one of the greatest problems that we also had as well. Most of these students didn't know each other before um, joining the course and also joining teams uh, with one another. So um, it, it was the, one of the biggest uh, problems that we had there, yeah. Great. Okay, so now I think we can take the, the question for uh, Satrio. No, sorry, for yeah. Bubana. Please, Satrio, you can uh, ask. Thank you. So basically, the question is if I have, a, say, a, a, a traditional lecture that with a duration of, say, 100 minutes, and I want to convert it into this kind of uh, cyclic session, how would I, how would you recommend we do that? Um, that's a great question, uh, Satrio. Like I said, you know, we had 50-minute lecture sessions, so I'm not quite sure how you could keep the, the attention span of students. Let's say you had 40 to 50 students in a class or even larger. Um, how do you keep the attention span of someone from a 50-minute session to a 100-minute session? So I haven't studied how that scales. So I can speak to you from my experience. I think in a traditional 50-minute lecture session, I would aim for maybe three or at the most four uh, PI cycles. Like I said, each cycle is a mini lecture followed by uh, the, the actual cycle is a vote, then discussion, vote again, instruct, instructor explanation, and then moving on, right? The one thing I think makes a huge difference from traditional lecture to PI is that PI uses the flipped classroom approach, which I didn't have a, a time to talk about at this in this mini presentation. So students do typically have some background knowledge coming into the class with the basic, very basic ideas. You know, so if they were coming into a unit testing class, they would understand basically what a test case is or, you know, how do you test boundary conditions or so, something very basic, you know, the idea of what a test is supposed to do. And in the unit testing class, maybe we explain clearly what is a unit, what what kinds of things should you not have in a unit test? What how do you test for exceptions? How do you test for timeouts and things like that? So I think, you know, you come in with a little bit of background with some required readings and then maybe three to four sessions. I'm not quite sure you can scale that up to, this is just my gut saying how, how much we can do, but you know, it's up for scientific, you know, exploration. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting approach and I'm, I might want to try it in my next uh, classes. Oh, that's great. If you, if you want to talk later, I'd be happy to um, chat. Sure. Thank you. Great. Uh, so we can ask uh, if uh, uh, any question for Satrio. If anyone want to guiding peer feedback in learning software design use UML was the paper. Maybe you can explain us the future work, no? Your future work, Sadrio. So because you say that you want to try. Please, maybe to understand how, please. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, a discussion in, in my first uh, presentation session in ICSI. So uh, the first one is someone asked uh, about this ap applicability of this peer feedback in a, let's say in a different, uh, I mean, we, uh, studied a classroom setting for bachelor's students, but there are people who does like architect software architecture course for for professionals with like ten years of development experience. Uh, and will it be the same or different? And I, I, I we thought that for such kind of uh, setting, I think peer feedback would even be more uh, useful because the peer have experience and they can um, they can learn from their own experience of what works and what does not work 
and it would be a valuable feedback for others or for, and for their peers. And then there's another discussion about uh, unlearning. So if what's the, the effect on the, on the good or bad feedback to what the students have learned? If they learn correctly and they receive bad feedback, will, will there be uh, unlearning and cause that cause the student to forget about uh, what is actually the, the good one and the other way around. So it's also a good direction to continue off from my uh, from our research that, that we have now. Great. Thanks a lot. I have a question for Satriya as well, if I can. Please, please. Um, I, for, for the course, we, we did the, one of our interventions was giving targeted feedback and I'm, I'm wondering how um, your results can also apply because your results are about peer feedback but how can they apply to like expert and student feedback in that sense mm, for expert uh, actually there's also a study by by a colleague of mine that says that actually experts and students pay the a similar focus uh, have the similar focus when assessing students feedback so uh, sorry students design so I guess there should still be some parallels and that uh, and act actually that study was also something that uh, served as a as a validation let's say that uh, peer feedback is can actually be useful because peer did uh, look at the same things that experts did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I will Great. definitely look more into. Uh, I see some really good points here for us as well. Thank Great. You. Great. And I would like to uh, for for Luis to have uh, some question. One question at least for Luis. Anyone Thank have you. any? So Luis presented the uh, Keeping Funny Live and Experience Report on Running Online Coding Camps. So um, as I understood that the, um, I mean, your study, I mean, in general is uh, based on the technology, you say that one important uh, assumption and also probably the future step no, is uh, this technology. Can you maybe let us uh, elaborate more on that? Yes, um, right now we have a good uh, stack of technology that enable these sort of experiences. So the simple fact of having Zoom, having Teams, having formats like, like MidSpace that we are using, it's a great enabler. On the, uh, at the same time, having block-based programming tools like Scratch, App Inventor, uh, Thunkable also give us a super big hand on uh, teaching these basic principles and so forth. What we believe that is... Um, an important outlook that we eventually need to strengthen these sort of experiences is a collaboration tools because a collaboration tool are, are like super professional, like Google Suite, Google mm -hmm. Docs, uh, GitHub. So all these focus a lot on, on people who is already experienced or professional doing that thing. So having like lo-fi uh, collaboration tools that will let us also have some sort of like sharing interaction but targeted to a younger audience would be also part of what we what we believe that is part of the open items or the open holes that, that we have for example Thunkable or App Inventor or Scratch they are not collaborative so they need to work on their own and then glue everything together different to what when we code and we pull our uh, changes to GitHub so uh, so my, my view on this is twofold. On the one hand, we already have a good stack of tools. On the other hand, we, we need to strain that thing on different audiences. Great. Do you have any comment for uh, Luis? If maybe also in your work, you have the same, uh, you identify the same challenge? For in, in uh, especially for my work, we, we have mm -hmm. identified the challenges of engagement as well. 
and uh, it's it's quite tricky because we are in a course setting so you we have to be very precise on how we we provide uh, a way to improve engagement but not distract the students from uh, com accomplishing their work because you will be graded for this at the end it's not a total fun engagement. I don't know if you have a comment on uh, maybe this thin line that you suggest that we can walk that can improve our engagement without totally distracting the students. Well, in, in, in that aspect, uh, by explaining them what is the goal of the of the game and setting also like a, a sharp line that the game's over. We need to get back to our, you know, educational setting, and then explain them the reason why we had this game. That it was for relaxing, for having fun, but at the same time, it has a purpose in our journey. I think it was a good way to uh, this blurry line between what is fun for the sake of having fun and fun for the sake of learning could, you know, have a better match. Explaining with clarity what is the goal of the activity and what is the purpose of the activity. And this, I mean, this is a personal take. This may also work in adults. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment or question you have? Oh, from the audience? Is someone else from want to I think I have one last uh, clarification Please. type of question for uh Bhuvaneshwari. I think yes. Um with the peer-led uh, or peer-instructed uh, type courses, uh, we presume that the students have some knowledge of this before coming in, uh, at least to, to that session. Maybe they have learned a bit about it. Um, how did you see that? Uh, maybe I didn't understand how it was conducted throughout the course, but as the course keeps going on, um, we've seen student participation drop a bit because they're handling other courses at the same time. So not many students can be tip top like on their game about this knowledge. How, how did you see that work in your study and maybe how did you combat that or deal with that during your study as well? That's an excellent question. Thank you, uh, Amifon. I appreciate it. Um, first off, you know, the, the content remains the same, right? Whether you're doing it in pure lecture or in pure instruction. Let's assume these students are coming in without any prior knowledge of these topics into the course. But when they come into the session, like you said, pure instruction students have already had some required readings that they would have been assigned two days prior to the class. So if I had a class on Monday, I would assign the required readings on a Friday night. So Saturday and Sunday, they will go over some of the required readings. So they come in with some basic understanding of the topic. So we can actually use class time to be productive and, you know, discussing with each other and discussing with the, the instructor. Now, um, the student participation, you know, I gave them an optional 2% of their grade for participation. So typically the literature says five up to 5%. Um, you know, peer instruction's roots are in, you know, physics and it's, it was started by Professor Eric Mazur. It's a very popular pedagogical approach in you know, the other STEM sciences. So it's been widely used in, his, in uh, physics and chemistry and biology and medicine and engineering. And CS is kind of you know, catching up over the last 20 years or so. So even the, the literature on CS peer instruction as well and software engineering, basically, this is my work is, I think, is the beginning of what we see with peer instruction in software engineering. So they all recommend that to keep students' morale up and to keep their you know, motivation up, to keep their participation going, you assign up to 5% of the grade purely based on participation and not on correctness. I think that's a very important thing. So if you participate in vote one and vote two and consistently do that throughout the semester, somebody's keeping track. And most of these student response systems that they use, I use the cloud-based version. So Everything is on the cloud. The data is on the cloud. You can just take it and analyze it. So, uh, you know, no, without, you know, this worry of, oh, my gosh, I got this question wrong. The, the goal is to actually learn, right, not to worry about the grade. 
So it's kind of like an automatic 5% that the students would get by simply participating and being aware and really talking to each other and doing what was required of them. So grading based on participation and not on correctness for up to 5%. I use 2% and that has been, because I'm fairly stingy with my grades, but you know, I, I tried with 2% and it works. So um, maybe with differing types of cohorts, it may be different, but I tried it on honor students on a combination of business and, you know, um, you know, computer science and software engineering type students. I tried it on purely CSNC majors, as you saw in this replication study. So far it, at our R1 university in the Midwest, it's worked. Different students are different. So you might have to tweak it out a little bit. Great, great. And also I think Sebastian, no, you had the same, uh, more or less the problem of the generalization of the result, no? Because it was a small, uh, you can elaborate yeah. on that if you want to add. Yes, we we taught three courses, but we have a small sample because um, we were two teachers and mm -hmm. we can manage um, up to 20 students per course or less because we have to follow up their work and, and do a, a lot of tracking in the, their progress so that they can really learn all the learning outcomes that were more than 50 learning outcomes. Yes, we are trying to, yes, we publish the material of the course for that, not only to, 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 to their use, the, uh, but also for replication of our study, for, for a bigger sample and replications because we wanted to know if uh, the effect of the course in other universities is the same or not. This is very important because if we want to use EPC to in some way bridge the gap between academia and industry, we, we want to, we need to learn more about the effect of EPC. Great, great. And also this decision support, decision making process, no? This is your yeah. final. Uh, Yes, we, we wanted also to study more about the, the decision uh, making in, in, in other fields, uh, in other field, no, in other contexts, for example, in industry, in, in government. The, so, because, uh, you know, novice uh, students that uh, are beginning to work in professional practice, they, they used uh, the, as decision making information what they learn or what the colleagues say to them, but uh, the, there is a different story in government or in industry for mm -hmm. for other people because they, they have another tools. So the, the effect of uh, the introduction of FC in this uh, context should be very different, I, we suppose. We are also saying that. Okay, great. I don't know if uh, someone, anyone have any other... Uh question or comment last question a quick question or comment i had a Please. quick qu comment if i may um both sebastian um and uh, abasi amifon and satru I, I would love to collaborate with you guys at some point or chat a bit more i've sent you guys linkedin invites please feel free to connect Great. Um, sebastian especially okay. i'm very curious to see how the soft skills that you're talking about you know whether people learn it better with ebsi versus some of the other approaches that I'm using, I'd be very curious to see if we can collaborate. Okay. Great, great. In fact, I also in encourage you to use these uh, rooms, this coffee room no, that we have at Ixi for uh, establish uh, collaboration. You can take contact and also, uh, because uh, as you said, uh, there are very similar uh, points no, in, uh, in your paper, a lot of uh, similar challenges that uh, you can learn from each other and address uh, together. Okay. So if there is no any other question or comment, I think we can close the session. And uh, I really thank you a lot for all the great presentation, for all the great uh, discussion, and uh, I wish you all the best and uh, for the future. And uh, I hope to see together in some paper <laughs> to collaborate. Okay, so please enjoy ICSI and uh, have fun. Bye. Thank you for Thank the you. organization. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks.